I'm at ESC 2012, and I'm with two of my favorite folks on the subject of atrial fibrillation, Lars Wallenton and Michael Ezekowitz. This was a wonderful session. You had more than 100 people sitting out here watching a monitor because they couldn't get into the session. What were you guys talking about that was riveting so many people over there? Well, uh, there's obviously tremendous interest in atrial fibrillation and the novel anticoagulants. And uh, the point that both Lars and I made was that the trials far exceeded their expectation when they were originally designed. But the disappointment at the moment is in patients that have a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, and I know the data best from the United States, is that there is underutilization of anticoagulation and particularly these novel agents. And... Um, we don't really understand why this is occurring. Now, my talk focused on the, the emphasis that clinicians seem to be making on the risks of novel anticoagulation, which was bleeding. And the point that I made to the audience was that these trials, which is a point that Lars also made, were huge in size, and none of them was stopped because of adverse events or higher bleeding rates than the gold standard, which was warfarin. So this is very important to emphasize. Dr. Wallenton, are you doing any better in Europe in terms of getting this balance? There seems to be a lot of emphasis on risk, but do we really appreciate the benefits? No, I, I think there is an underuse and a slow uptake even in Europe. And I mean, there are very strong evidence. This is based on 55,000 patients. All these compounds are at least or more effective, more effective for stroke prevention than warfarin, all of them. All of them reduce intracranial hemorrhage and all of them are safe. And for some of them that are bigger than one ten dose, they're picked up on five milligram dose, m safer than warfarin. So we have treatments that are more effective, they are safer, they are more convenient, and still we are not using them. And people have been asking for these alternatives for years. And there are larger similarities than differences between the trials, which I emphasized. So this goes for all of them. And it's difficult to understand why we don't have a very rapid uptake. And the patient's preferences are, of course, to go with a standard dose treatment without repeated hospital visits, without affecting their lifestyle, without affecting their eating habits, without affecting them in relation to other medical treatments. So it's, it's difficult to understand. And, of course, the elephant in the room is economy. Correct. You want to be efficient and effective with your money. But, Dr. Izikowicz, you did a study not too long ago where you were seeing that doctors are overestimating the risk. When you ask them, what do you think the risk is for bleeding in a specific situation, they were maybe tenfold over what the actual bleeding risk was. What do you want to tell people? Where should these be used and when? Well, one of the important differences between this current era is one, the overestimation of the risk. Uh, and that's driven by the fact that after approval, there have been uh, sporadic reports uh, of bleeding uh, that have occurred in patients, and there has not been a denominator. The denominator is obviously the number of patients treated. It turns out that the sporadic reports the incidents taken into consideration, the denominator, the number of patients who've received the drugs, are actually even lower than the clinical trials. Now, another point that I'd like to make that Lars has also made is that in the warfarin era, the fear was intracerebral hemorrhage. Intracerebral hemorrhages are a devastating complications. P p patients are massively disabled after them. Anti Dotes do not work, and uh, it's, it's a terrible complication. The uh, intracerebral bleed rates with the novel agents are, are very significantly reduced. In two of the drugs, that is rivaroxabam and the higher dose of dabigatran, there is a, an excess of gastrointestinal hemorrhages. But gastrointestinal hemorrhages 
are not intracerebral hemorrhages. That doesn't mean to say that we do not need to spend more time and effort trying to determine the nature of these hemorrhages, the mechanism, and so forth. But for the time being, they are there. They are less than, um, uh, the bleeding rates are less than with warfarin. And um, this should not be a reason for hesitation in using these drugs. I think the new guidelines emphasize that almost all patients with atrial fibrillation should be treated with anticoagulation, and that's the most important message. And then warfarin is effective but has obvious downsides, and there is a recommendation that if a patient needs an oral anticoagulant, the new oral <coughs> anticoagulants are preferable, and they are, as a matter of fact, more effective, they are safer, and they are more convenient. And I think cardiologists need to accept innovations. We have always been doing that. Why don't we accept and why don't we push for the use of innovations? Innovation will stop unless we bring that to our patients and our patients are asking for innovations. They dislike the current treatment with warfarin and what it means. So I think we should go for innovation and the health economy looks very good with any oral anticoagulant versus aspirin or placebo. We gain money by treating these patients. That's and the gain is point. that we will have more patients exposed. Right. Uh, with Lars Wallington and Michael Lazikowicz, you do not have any better uh, commentary for this particular topic. Please search for both of them in uh, the Journal of American College of Cardiology. And for CardioSource World News, I'm the executive editor, Rick McGuire. Thanks. <laughs>